Welcome to the Edge Talk Radio Network, your weekly source for information, empowerment, and connection. The Edge Magazine and its advertisers bring you inspired interviews and conversation on learning and healing, on our sacred journey, and on topics that expand beyond time and space. Now, welcome today's host. Kundalini is an evolutionary energy that is designed for humanity's next step towards a luminous physical and spiritual expression. The Kundalini is in everyone. It is an untapped resource of divinity within us all that is waiting to be awakened and experienced. Never has the time been so right and crucial for a change of this magnitude to be explored and initiated. Greetings, I am Kathy Taylor and I am the host of Edge Interviews. Tonight I am thrilled to be bringing to you a conversation with Chris Mitchell, commonly known as Chrism, who will be introducing you to that power within you, the power that is called the Kundalini. Chrism describes himself as, quote, just another person like you, a consciousness clothed in flesh. I do not claim knowledge of the writings or activities of any ancient lineage or sacred text. I do claim the information received as is gifted to me by the expanded awareness of the Kundalini. I teach the Kundalini. Activate those who clearly are ready and support those who are awakened and following their Kundalini path. Chrism will be offering his support and activation at the Kundalini Awakening Seminar scheduled to take place in the Twin Cities on September 27th and 28th of this year, 2014, in Egan, Minnesota. For more information, please contact Rosemary at www.rosemaryg.usinternet.com or by calling her at 651-452-3161. You can also visit the website, which is www.kundaliniawakeningssystems1.com. And please just refer to the description of tonight's broadcast, and you can get the correct spellings and the way to connect with those. And as we get into the conversation, we will repeat that contact information. So, Chrism, are you there? Hello, Catherine. I'm here. Hi. Well, thank you so much for taking this time to talk to us about this fascinating subject. Well, thank you for having me on on your program. Uh, hopefully it will it will be a, a service for any and all who hear it. Well, I'm sure it will be. And I think because most people have heard the word kundalini, but, but a lot of people don't understand completely what it is, can we jump into just your giving us a, an overview of what kundalini is? Kundalini is a, a an energetic force and consciousness energy, if you will, that rests dormant at the base of, uh, of a human being's spine. Uh, for most of the population, it rests dormant. For some of the population, it will awaken in their lifetime. And that awakening has very powerful, beautiful, and special uh, skills and experiences that accompany it. Uh, and it also has a, a fair amount of challenges as well if the person uh, doesn't have the benefit of a teacher or a system that will help them understand what is occurring. And so this is what I do. This is what I help people with is their kundalini awakening or to to activate their kundalini. And uh, the kundalini itself is this energetic consciousness that rests at the base of the spine uh, coiled around the base of our spine three and a half times. Uh, and it can be awakened through spiritual practices, uh, breathing practices, near-death experiences, accidents, uh, studying with an awakened teacher, uh, just starting meditation. The person can have their kundalini awakened simply because it is time for them. It's 
it's like when the when the when the fruit is ripe, it is re- ready to be consumed, and that is the same thing with the Kundalini awakening in a person that has really done nothing to invite this. And mm-hmm. You'll forgive me, I have some airport noise behind me here. Is that all right? Oh, like, that's through fine. Okay? It's, that's you know, Blog Talk Radio is organic, so there's all those signs. What well, what I find really fascinating, Kristen, is is that. I've always considered Kundalini to be something that would be awakened or provoked by invitation, like someone would go into meditation. You're suggesting and saying that it, it can actually spontaneously emerge. Spon- oh, yeah, absolutely. So, absolutely so what would that look like? So what would that look like? Look, that, well, I mean, it depends on the, on the mental uh, disposition of the individual, mental and emotional disposition. Uh, but typically, uh, it's very beautiful. It's very, very exciting. It's, it's amazing. And then, depending on the, the, the person's outlook in life and their emotional stability, whether or not they go into fear in it will begin to really color the experience. If they start to go into fear over it, well, they, it can amplify that fear and it can be, become very, very distorted and twisted and, and, uh, you know, the person can have a fairly difficult time with it. Uh, but if they choose not to go into fear, they just kind of go with the beauty, go with the grace, go with the love that is happening. Uh, the person will go through a series of spontaneous movements that they won't understand. Uh, they'll go through a certain level of bliss, ecstatic bliss. Uh, they'll be happy for like days and days and weeks and weeks and months and months. They'll just be this tremendous level of happiness and joy and serenity that the person has and then that will taper off and then a level of detoxification will occur emotional detoxification uh physical detoxification uh you know karmic detoxification uh to 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 really be clear about it and as that detoxification occurs well they're becoming more and more and more in balance and in harmony with this divine presence within them, and this is a divine presence. Make mm-hmm. no mistake. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is the end point of all religions. This is the end point of all spiritual study. This is where physical mundane meets non-physical divine. Mm-hmm. This is that bridge. Well, I I had a friend actually in the early 80s that started meditating, and I'm sure that's what was starting to to be activated in her, but it freaked her out so much. And at that time, she tried to find a place where she could go to get some understanding with it, and it wasn't that readily available. And this is out in California. So is it fairly new to have people like you who can really guide people through this activation and, and the awakening process? Uh, what's your question again? I'm sorry. Is it fairly new, at least to the Western world, to have people that oh, can yeah. actually be guides through this process? Because I know in the early 80s, even out in California, she wasn't successful, and it scared her. So then oh, she no, was one no, that yeah. just pulled back, and she quit meditating because she didn't know how to deal with the movements that were coming and accompanying the awakening of the energy in her body. Oh, no, I completely understand and it's still hard to find a teacher that can actually go in to your process. I'm just blessed with being able to do that. Uh, I wish there were more. Mm-hmm. I wish there were more, and there are not. Uh, there are there are organizations that that kind of pretend to, you know, if you become a Hindu or you become this or you become that, then they can explain it to you using their own words. But to believe it, you have to kind of follow that religion. And Kundalini, as I mentioned, is beyond religion. Mm-hmm. It is the end point. Of, and so what is required is a, is a level of teachers, which I'm trying to produce, actually, through these seminars. I'm trying to produce Kundalini teachers mm-hmm. uh, to go out into the populations and to begin to explain to them that, no, 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 this does not have to be so scary for you. This is this is what's going on here, and this is what's going on there. And put your tongue up behind your upper front teeth here, and put your fingers in this position there, and drink lots of water, and stop drinking caffeine, and you know all of these types of things. And you can literally 
guide a person away from committing suicide because they have a spontaneous kundalini awakening. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, I think the reframe and just the understanding would have been so helpful to her because then it could have been directed. So I think I think we're really blessed to have people like you who have gone through it yourself. In fact, can you share a little bit about what your journey was? Because I'm sure when you came into this, there weren't a lot of teachers that were available to you. There were, yeah, there were no teachers. There were no books. Um, when this started to occur to me, well, first of all, I was born with a level of awakening already intact. And, and I need to preface that statement by saying that when you have the Kundalini awakened within you, it comes with you after you die. It is there with you along with your memories and your karma and the the touch of the divine never ever leaves the soul that it has touched. The touch of the divine has no uh it doesn't wear off with time, it doesn't lose its power, it is always the same, it is always strong. And so what happened to me is I, I was born into this world and I had all the symptoms of kundalini awakening as a child without knowing that that's what the symptoms were. Mm-hmm. And so as a child, you can become easily open to this type of thing because your, your, your ego hasn't matured to the point where, you know, you know, everything is set in stone according to how the ego wants it to be, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. As a child, you're able to kind of uh, you know, figure this out or see if this feels good or that feels good. And I worked with that, and I had a lot of experiences that were positive, but I had a lot more that weren't so positive. It was very difficult uh, uh, to be transported to the Amazon jungle every night mm-hmm. for years. Mm-hmm. Uh, I didn't know what a howler monkey was. It, I just knew that they scared the heck out of me. Mm-hmm. I didn't know what, what these different animals I would come into contact were. Every night this occurred to me. Every night until about the age of 13. And then it stopped. And then I was able to, to have somewhat of a normal um, um, high school experience, junior high high school experience until it, it came back again at the age of 24. Uh, but But as... You know, as I, you know, after our, this body, so, so let me, let me go back again. So, if you have the Kundalini and it's come to you, uh, into your next expression, your next lifetime, and you're a child, uh, you go through a level of karmic burning, karmic balancing through the Kundalini, but your, the Kundalini that was there in the previous life is guiding you now. It's guiding you now as a child. And you're guided to read certain things. You're guided to experience certain things. You're guided to do certain things. And I was guided to do the, you know, certain types of things, whether it was meditation. Uh, I would go out and, and meditate in the, in the wilderness when I was nine, you know, and I would say mm-hmm. things like, you know, spirits of the universe, send me a gift or something of that nature. And I would always get that gift. And I had learned not to talk about it with my parents because my parents didn't understand any of this. They, you know, they were chalking it up to an overactive imagination. Mm-hmm. And um, and so I learned not to talk about it with people. I learned to have these blessed little skills uh, that I had without bringing attention to myself. And that was a very big lesson to not want to be Superman, even though you may have Superman attributes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and so so as this matured within me and my, my uh, emotional maturity uh, accompanied that, uh, you know, I, I, I would kind of designed uh, within a healing mentality, you know, since that time. And, you know, for that healing ment- mentality, you know, I had to know what it is to be sick as well as what it is to be well. You need to know both sides mm-hmm. of the coin. Contrast. And so I was shown that through various experiences. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, at the age of 13, it, it kind of went on hold for about 10 years. When I was 24, uh, 23, 24, it came back. And it came back because of a visitation from a discarnate entity that, 
decided to sit down on the edge of my bed and lean over and envelop me in their energy. And uh, after that, wow, the Kundalini jumped up and, and it was active in me for uh, from then to now. Mm-hmm. Um, so this body, this physical body that's forming these words that you're hearing right now, this body had to go through its own awakening, just like the uh, in the previous life, that body had to go through it. Well, now this body had to go through that that rewiring event. And so at the age of 30, I had the uh, primary spinal sweep, which is the kundalini, you know, uh, awakening from the base of the spine, traveling up the spine and out, going out the fontanelle of the person and showering down in, in, in light uh, around the person and, of course, putting the uh, the physical body into various uh, automatic positions of grace and reception and bliss and ecstasy and, you know, all these really, really beautiful, beautiful experiences. And after that, you know, I had to kind of relearn what Kundalini was. Mm-hmm. And as I mentioned before, there were no teachers uh, so I had to just kind of figure this out on my own, and I and I did, you know, I was in the corporate world, you know, I was on my way to becoming, you know, a manager at uh, MCA at the time, which was a big company at the time, MCA, Music Company of America, and I was uh, working the, the corporate ladder there, and after the Kundalini came, everything stopped in the mundane world for me. I had to, I had to learn why, you know, I was experiencing what I was experiencing. I had, I knew I had to figure it out. I knew that this wasn't going to go well. If, if I stayed in the corporate world, this was going to be a very difficult scenario. It was already getting difficult. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I became homeless for the next 10 years or more, hmm. trying to figure this out. Well, I had medical experience, so I knew that it wasn't a medical problem, I, but I also knew that my, my soap, diagnosis my subjective objective assessment prognosis wasn't going wasn't looking very good and uh you know from my own uh you know deductive reasoning i knew that i i couldn't take it to a counselor a psychologist psychiatrist md anybody because they were just going to push prozac oriented uh chemicals and medications at me and and label me with uh schizophrenia with positive uh, expressions of bipolarism, things of that nature, which are absolutely untrue, Mm -hmm. but which Kundalini can bring about. And so I can't fault the the medical people for making that DX because, or that diagnosis, because uh, people will exhibit some of the very similar phenomena that uh, that those that have those those illnesses will exhibit. And so, you know, it's an easy mistake Mm -hmm. to make. Mm Mm-hmm. So then, how well, I didn't did, do that. How did you find your path into being a teacher, from being homeless to find, being a teacher? See, no, I, I, I didn't find that path. That path found me. All right. I, uh, distinction. Yeah, I wasn't looking to be a teacher. I didn't really, you know, I, I was not looking to be a teacher. But I could see because the Kundalini will push you into selfless service for other people. I could see that I was being pushed into that area by the Kundalini itself. And by that time, I had learned through trial and error that you don't resist the Kundalini. When it when it wants to push you in a certain way, well, you answer that push with, yes, okay, absolutely, here we go. And that's what I did. That's what I did. I, uh, I just, I started a Yahoo group and, and it just grew exponentially really fast. And uh, the Kundalini started doing its teachings through that group. And mm-hmm. and now we have, like, close to, I think, uh, seven or eight communities. And, uh, you know, we have people from all over the world, thousands of people. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of the genesis of the teaching. And here's the thing is, you know, I put out the website KundaliniAwakeningSystems1.com and the writings that came through the Kundalini pretty much speak for themselves. A person reads those writings, they'll feel the Kundalini. I, I can't say that the writing's the greatest, but 
that was those were the earlier days, you know, back in 2005, 2006, when I was just starting to do this. I had never seen myself as a writer before, but the Kundalini had other ideas. And so uh, a bunch of writings came through and a bunch of writings were put up. And uh, people started reading those writings and uh, started responding to those writings in very positive ways, which, which you know, really bolstered the whole idea of giving these teachings through the written format. And then from there, you know, 300 uh, YouTube videos were created. Mm. And, uh, you know, these 300 YouTube videos can be reached by people just going uh to to Chris and Kundalini on YouTube and and it'll come up. Mm-hmm. Well, I imagine if somebody just even went in and searched Kundalini that they would ultimately get to your channel. I say again. Say what I w- well, YouTube is now the the fastest growing search engine. It's uh, what I've heard is it's surpassed Google. And so what I'm saying is that people could just go in and in the YouTube channel itself, search for Kundalini, and I'm sure they'd be taken to some of your video and, and YouTube well, videos. To some of them, yeah. There's, you know, everybody and their uncle now, uh, you know, seems to feel that they're a Kundalini awakened teacher or master, and so whether they've had it or not, mm-hmm. you know, and so you get a famous author out there. Well, I wrote a really good book, and so I must have Kundalini, right? Uh, which is absolutely not true. So for someone who's really searching, they really need to do their homework to find someone yeah. who can guide them, who's who's had the experience yeah. and yeah. who has yeah. the knowledge of of that instruction. Exactly, exactly. You want to find a teacher who, first of all, is willing to take the time with you as an individual. Mm-hmm. I find a lot of these big names, these big authors, these, these so-called teachers, you know, They'll answer a general question, but they don't care about you as an individual. Mm-hmm. You know, you need to be able to have a teacher that will go in, see your process, understand your tro- your process, and and begin to teach you about your process, mm-hmm. not about his process, but about your process and your karma and and the the uh, the challenges that the Kundalini is bringing up for you in your process to work through the uh, gifts that that same kundalini is also bringing up and to be able to explain those gifts so that they don't frighten a person. Mm-hmm. Things like that. So is it like the relationship a student would have with a guru or how would you define that relationship between uh, you, you know, and someone guru, you're helping? Guru has, a very, guru has a very negative connotation in the West. Uh, master has a very negative connotation in the West. Uh, so for me, it's just teacher. Teacher's fine. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And what's the structure? Like, if someone wanted to work with you, how how do they go about it? How how do you? Well, they are, they are they they need to read the writings. They need to begin practicing the safety protocols for Kundalini awakening. Then uh, we will either meet over Skype, you know, if they're living a long ways away, or we'll meet in person, and we'll begin we'll begin to to work with them on an individual basis about where they need to go, how they need to get there, what they need to do, and, uh, you know, what what process is going to happen for for them. Mm-hmm. And that that is a huge blessing because when you have no instruction and this type of, of stuff happens to you, it, to, to, to say that it makes you think you're crazy is putting it very, very lightly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, you, and I think you're you accurate. Question your reality. Right, but, and I think you're accurate that, Many people get into the mental health arena and then the diagnoses come and the labels come and there's a lot of people in the back wards who are being given all these, you know, medications that quiet them that really just need to be guided and helped through this journey, I would assume. Oh, that's right. That's right. Because, you know, you can hear voices with a Kundalini awakening and hearing voices is, you know, one of the prime... uh, uh, diagnoses for schizophrenia. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, absolutely. Okay. You can hear a voice, you can hear an entity, you can hear all of that, and and if you tell a, an MD or a, a psychologist, a psychiatrist that you're hearing voices, well, there they go. They're getting out the uh, the schizophrenic drugs. Right, absolutely. And they're not even 
They're not, you know, once, all they have to do is hear that few, that one sentence from you. Oh, I hear voices every now and again. Oh, you do? Oh, okay, that's fine. Right. Here we that's go. The the mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. That's the criteria. That's the criteria, schizophrenic. So, you know? so what is that process of awakening? What is it? What is it's it? It's awakening to the truth of your divine self. Uh, if any of your listeners have uh, an interest in who and how they are beyond the the reality paradigm that we're you know we're programmed to believe is real, you know through science and through law and through religion and through uh, education. Uh, if, if any of, of your listeners would like to reach beyond society and beyond the accepted programming mechanisms of the various institutions I just mentioned, then you go into the Kundalini. The Kundalini awakening itself is beyond words. It's In a way, it's unspeakable. But it's unspeakable joy. It's unspe- uh, unspeakable bliss. Uh, but if, if it isn't... If it isn't treated in the right way, it can be unspeakable terror as well. And so you really want to have a teacher that is based in in love, in life, in communication, in joy, happiness, harmony, forgiveness, compassion, selfless service to others. This is the quality of a teacher you want to bring into your Kundalini awakening with you. That kind of a person can really help you focus on the goodness that is occurring, focus on the more challenging uh, aspects that are occurring, or if, the, if there's any pain or any nightmares or, you know, any kind of uh, negative uh, visits from uh, from an entity of whatever. You need a person who can talk with you and walk with you through these areas, and, and this is this is what I'm doing. So you offer what I believe you call safety protocols. Now, are these the protocols... Safety protocols, right. safety protocols for Kundalini Awakening. And are these protocols that you developed? Well, the, well that's do, you want to, you, do, do you want to know the genesis of that program? Yes, I think that'd be good. In my second uh, seminar, which took place in Santa Cruz, California, I think around 2006, uh, at the time I was giving, you know, I would give active Shaktipat for a person. Shaktipat means activating their kundalini by use uh, of the kundalini that flows through me. And uh, I, I gave this guy, this individual, Shaktipat, but I had certain questions about it for myself. I was just kind of going, I, I don't know about this. And the kundalini allowed me to go ahead and do it anyway. And he had... Seven, actually, along his spine, red welts came up over the over the uh, nerve plexi centers or chakra centers, and I thought, oh no, this is horrible. Yeah, the first thing, you know, you do no harm, you do no harm, you never hurt. And uh, so I was very upset over that. And uh, the red welts went down immediately, but his shakti pot remained in it, and. Uh, to go a little over the edge, I think, in control issues and and uh, um, maybe some uh, some of the issues about uh, self validation and things of that nature. And, and so we were able to to work with him and get those things straightened out. But the way after that, I you know I just sat down in meditation and I had a little conversation with my Kundalini. Said, look, you know, I don't want to hurt anybody. I don't want anybody to come into this without information. And the it just downloaded the safeties into my head. Hmm. It took it took practical uh, practices from almost every culture on this world, including the shamanic, uh, and condensed it into one great teaching, one great practice that a person can do every day. And this is what I teach, and this will save a person from going crazy in the kundalini if they practice the safeties they should do very very well now are these safety protocols 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 that you deal with in the youtubes and in the writings as well or is the only way to get access to them is through your workshops 
No, no, no. You can get them at the workshop. I, uh, they are part of the workshop, though, because they are a standalone activation equation. I mean, you can just do the safeties and begin to activate your Kundalini. And so, of course, at the uh, at the seminar, I teach the safeties. Mm-hmm. Okay, but I also give huge levels of information about the Kundalini, uh, what it is, how it is. Uh, how you are within it, how it is within you, uh, how the environment begins to respond with you differently, how how your environment and your awareness of what is real begins to expand, how to deal with that expansion and what other life forms and consciousness exist beyond the narrow uh, focus of a five sense human being and what happens when you when your eyes are opened into the infinite. What happens then and how do you deal with that? Mm-hmm. So we talk about all of those uh, scenarios. And, uh, you know, I take questions at the seminars. I'm not a person that says, okay, wait for me to say my thing, and then you can ask questions. I'll take questions right now mm-hmm. with people. I want people to know. I want them to ask questions that are near and dear to their heart so that if they don't leave with anything else, then at least they've left with the questions, the answers that were to questions near and dear to their heart. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, as soon as as soon as a person comes into the seminar, they are they are wrapped in my kundalini immediately. Mm-hmm. I don't have to say a word, and that process begins to disseminate and to evaluate uh, the you know that person's level of awareness for kundalini and what is best for them to to do and to experience as they as they begin seeking more information or actually seeking the activation itself. Mm-hmm. So you can go to the website, Kundalini Awakening Systems 1.com, that's the numeral 1.com, and if you go into the margin on the, on the left side, about the fifth option down is called The Safeties, and uh, you, can, you can print them out. I invite everyone listening to print out those safeties. Um, I want them to read them. Read them at least three times and begin to practice them. Mm-hmm. You'll notice that there are levels of vertical yoga. Vertical yoga is what draws uh, energy from uh, the lower part of the body straight up the spine. And this is the path that we want the kundalini to go, mm-hmm. straight up the spine. So what have you witnessed is kind of the integration process that happens with somebody where they're starting to awaken and and get to know the kundalini, how does that impact their participating in their day to day life? Going to a job well, that they might be in. Well, the interesting thing is, is I've seen that happen right there at the seminar. Uh, I give the shakti pot, and boom, they have it. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, the paradigm has shifted for them from one from a paradigm where oh gosh you know i just came to this seminar because it sounded really cool you know and geez i didn't think any of it was real (laughs) (laughs) i didn't think this was gonna happen (laughs) and so and, and i've had you know i've had people just 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 fall into tears and and ask for it to be mitigated and of course i can i i can mitigate that but uh yeah, so, you know, with people, when they have this, it's a real change in your reality. It's beautiful. It's beautiful, but you have to realize it's a change, and you don't want to resist the changes that are coming. With how, how it affects people in their, in their normal day-to-day life, well, all of a sudden you, you feel more, you see more, you experience more. Uh, you, your, your, your sensorial pickup is extremely elevated. Uh, your strength and your endurance can be extremely elevated. And conversely, it can be, you know, you can have all your energy just, it feels like it's just being sucked away and then replaced with something different. And sometimes, you know, that's a little confusing for people to to keep aware of. I mean, there are many, many, many different levels of, of Kundalini uh, expression and, hap- you know, that happens for a person when when you know they're new to the activation much of the kundalini itself is about acclimating yourself to the new person you're becoming uh through the kundalini and so as that acclimation occurs you become stronger and stronger and stronger and 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 uh and far 
far better able to uh, to live a life of an awakened saint inside of a society that doesn't recognize awakened saints. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it sounds like a real surrendering process. Extremely so, yes. Surrendering and, and tolerating and changing your inner inner dogma to to that of of honesty, truth, compassion, forgiveness, uh all the noble qualities that lead one into enlightenment. So then is part of the challenge a person is spiritually ready for this, but then the ego comes in and I would assume through addictions and 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 distractions puts a lid on that energy because they don't know how to deal with it. Well, they try. They'll they'll try to put a lid on the energy, but that's not necessarily something that that that, that is always allowed. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to change my position here, so just a moment. Yeah, uh, sometimes the Kundalini itself will not allow the person to to change how the energy is affecting them. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, within that context, the person just needs to surrender, not try to change, not try to manipulate the energy. A lot of people get lost in trying to to manipulate the energy, to control the kundalini, and that is a big, big mistake. The kundalini doesn't take well to people trying to, uh, uh, shall we say, usurp its position or its agenda within the body, and it will it will respond to a person in a in a painful fashion if they keep trying to do that. Uh, it responds very very tolerantly at first. It, you know, it's not one to just slap a person down. It's very very gentle, but as the person continues to to cause that problem for themselves, well, then the kundalini will in- incrementally get harder and harsher in its correction. Mm-hmm. So once it's been activated or awakened, then it's a process that that has its own, ag- not agenda, but its own course that it's going to follow. Well, yeah, it, it has its own course, and, and, and I use the word agenda. Do you? Uh, mm-hmm. it, it does have its own agenda of, you know, it rewires the human body. It rewires it. Say, if you were to relate it to an automobile, it would be rewiring the human body from a 12-volt system to a 12-million-volt system. Mm-hmm. And not everybody's going to be happy about that rewiring. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So that would be part of the challenge and part of the reason they would need someone to instruct them through those challenges. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Because there is something that is called an electrical kriya. And an electrical kriya is a spontaneous bolt of energy that it, that enters into a person's spine, uh, you know, within the first, typically within the first six months of a, of a kundalini awakening. And it literally feels like you're sitting on an 8,000 volt electrical line. It is so strong, it can propel you across the room. Mm-hmm. Like it did my friend that I talked about. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, that's literally what happened to her. Is she was being yeah. thrown across the room, and she just she didn't know how to manage that, so she just shut it down. Oh, yeah. It was scary. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Mm-hmm. You get literally thrown across the room, and and you're you're landing there in front of the TV or whatever. You're going, well, what the heck was that? Mm-hmm. <laughs> You know, mm-hmm. you know and, 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 you know, so the first place you're going is where? You're going into fear. Right. Now you're going into fear because, whoa, that was, that was, that was, that was way too much. Right. And, uh, and stop meditating. You, you know, I mean, for people that are, that I can see are just devolving into a level of panic and fear, then I tell them, I say, stop meditating, stop doing yoga, stop doing Pilates, stop doing Anything of a spiritual or religious function, stop doing everything mm-hmm. and just let yourself calm. Let mm-hmm. yourself calm. Mm-hmm. 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 That works for her, it sounds like. It sounds mm-hmm. like that works mm-hmm. for her. Now, how is this different or maybe maybe misdiagnosed when somebody has just incessant 
anxiety, and no matter what they do, it's not being quieted, and yet they just feel like they're in this this hypervigilant, reactive state, almost like they're in a spiritual or emotional spasm. Would that be the kundalini, or how would it be different? Oh, yeah. oh ab- absolutely, that can be the kundalini, and, and a lot of it uh, has to do with what, their, what the level of adrenaline in their bloodstream is, is doing and what's causing, uh, say, an elevated increase in, uh, in the adrenal function within the person. When the kundalini reaches the, the kidneys, well, it also reaches the adrenals. Mm-hmm. And what it does is it will infuse. And you can actually feel the infusion of the kidneys. The kidneys will begin to protrude about one-third more of their size uh, they increase in size for a short time, and you can literally feel them extruding out of your skin. And you, you know, you feel towards your back and your spine. You can feel your skin, your kidneys, while you're going, "Whoa, I must have a stone or something like." You know, you you leap to the worst case scenario. Mm-hmm. And if you go to the doctor, they confirm it. <laughs> no, they go to the you go to the doctor and they go, "Oh no, I don't see any renal gravel there. You're fine. Oh, have a okay. nice day." Yeah, the, the the doctors will very rarely find any evidence for kundalini awakening symptoms. Everything from from heart attacks to sometimes your blood pressure will go sky high and then go really low. Your your heart rate will go sky high and you're thinking, oh my God, tachycardia, I'm having a heart attack. Oh, I better go to the ER. You run on over to the ER and you wait for eight hours or so, and then they take you in and. They, you know, they strap you up and they, they take all the ECGs and all the different tests, you know, and they say, oh, sorry, Mr. Chrisom, maybe you're just having a little anxiety. Mm-hmm. Here, here, take this, this pill. Mm-hmm. Now, you do a lot of work with with counselors and doctors trying to educate them about this. Is that accurate? Most doctors don't want to be educated about kundalini, and certainly not from someone that doesn't have some sort of a, uh, a group of letterings behind their name. Mm-hmm. Um, but but I get a lot of MDs coming to my to my communities. I get a lot of MDs coming and reading my information, and that's that to me is the best way. They need to learn in a way that that keeps their ego happy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I'm all for that. I mean, a, a doctor with a happy ego, if he has to have one, I'd rather have him have a happy one than a than an angry or belligerent one. Mm-hmm. So, in the ideal world, if if an MD was educated on this, what would be the ideal way that that uh, he or she could really help somebody be directed to the right instruction instead of perpetuating the the diagnostic method? Well, well, in the you know, in a better world, I won't say the ideal, but in a better world, the MD would know that this is Kundalini awakening event, or what term these days they call it a spiritual emergency, mm-hmm. and uh, they would know that this is what is occurring. They would know that if they just tell the person to put the tongue tip behind the upper front teeth, things are going to smooth out quite quickly. They don't need to be dispensing clonopin. They don't need to be dispensing, you know, any of these SSRIs. You know, so the SSRI and this great connection with, uh, you know, the uh, drug companies uh, would disappear in the context of kundalini awakening types of scenarios. And that would be a much better world if if our doctors and, and nurses and, and psychologists, psychiatrists, counselors, if they learn to expand their understandings of the human condition beyond their training, beyond what, say, an organization like the AMA considers to be the only correct course, if they're able to expand their, themselves beyond uh, their training, their schools, and their expectations, uh, then, yeah, they'd be able to help people in a much, in a much, more compassionate way, in a, in a, in a far more effective way, mm-hmm. and uh, in, a, in, in a way that is far less traumatic for the patient that's, that's having this occur. Now, do you find that that term, because I've heard that term, spiritual emergency, used even in the medical world, do you find that that is becoming a little bit more uh, receptive 
two possible well, spiritual. They, they, the, the medical, the medical uh, people came up with that term on their own because they were running into a lot of kundalini. And there are some few uh, MDs who aren't afraid to write and, and who, I mean, I know a few of them myself that are, you know, they're full-on um, American Medical Association accredited MDs, and they know about the kundalini. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, and so these spiritual emergency on their on their own, and uh, they're comfortable with that. They still are treating it far too heavily with drugs, mm-hmm. uh, you know, because of, of the symptoms and, you know, the when you do an intake and the symptom says, or the, the, the patient says, oh, I'm hearing voices, well, you know, boom. Mm-hmm. That lowers the schizophrenia, the mm-hmm. DX, mm-hmm. on the person. Or, you know, oh, I'm feeling really happy one day and really sad the next. Oh, well, that lowers the bipolar mm-hmm. uh, diagnosis on that person. And so, you know, there's, it's a slow expansion into the medical field, but I didn't expect it to be fast. Anywhere, anytime you've got a system that, that uh, that uh, rewards itself if a person is sick instead of rewarding itself when the person is better. Mm-hmm. Well, then you're going to have you're going to have problems. Mm-hmm. Well, hopefully all of those systems are beginning to erode. But well, so how does somebody get in touch with you to work with you individually? And let's talk a little bit about the workshop, the upcoming workshop that you're going to have in the Twin Cities. Before we run out of well, time. Well, one, one, one good way is to come to the workshop. Uh, call uh, Rosemary G. at, U, at usinternet.com. Is that what it is? Is that what you put down? Yes, and I can actually keep talking and I can find the phone number, too, because I have that as well. Yeah, yeah. So come to the seminar. Come meet me. I'll, I'll be doing some speaking engagements the week before the seminar throughout the uh, Twin Cities area. Uh, come to one of those speaking engagements. See what it's like. See how it feels. Even as you listen to this interview, feel the kundalini in the voice. Feel it. Feel the voice reaching into you, and see if it works. To see if this is this is calling to you. Mm-hmm. And if it is calling to you, then answer that call. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you can reach me by by coming to the to the seminar. Uh, you can reach me on Facebook, uh, Chris Mitchell on Facebook. Uh, I don't know how many, there's probably a thousands of those on Facebook. But I'm on Facebook. If you go to a, a, a group on Facebook called Kundalini Awakening! Exclamation Point, well, that's one of the communities. You can also go to Kundalini Awakening Systems 2 on Facebook. That's another Facebook group. Mm. There's a Yahoo group called Kundalini Awakening Systems 1 at yahoogroups.org. Uh, you can also go to YouTube and just push in, you know, Chris Mitchell, Kundalini, or Chrisum, and uh, those, I have about 300 of those videos, they'll come up, and uh, they can also begin to instruct you. I get a lot of people uh, coming by by virtue of watching those videos. Right. And if, if you have any question about me or, or how I teach or how I am, just watch the videos. Right. It's safe. You're, you're at the comforts of your own home. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, my kundalini will reach into you from the video, but it's for that specific topic that we're discussing on the video. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I go into spiritual emergency. I go into the dark night of the soul. I go into... Uh, uh, you know, forgiveness. I go into uh, bliss and ecstasy, and you know the really beautiful aspects of the awakening. And I, I tend to want to slant things a little more to the beauty because things have been slanted to the terrifying far too much. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the contact phone number is six five one four five two three one six one, and her name is Rosemary, right? Rosemary. Rosemary. And this is going to happen in the Twin Cities. It's called the Kundalini Awakening Seminar, September 27th and 28th in Egan. And Rosemary's email, I assume, is www.rosemaryg at usinternet.com. And then the actual website is www.kundaliniawakening.com. Systems 
www.thepowerofthenameofjesus1.com. And both of those pieces of contact information are in the description of this broadcast, so you can go there to access them as well. Well, any last parting things that you would like to share with the audience before we run out of time? Yeah, yeah. Kundalini is is the source of the force. If you watch Star Wars, you know, let the force be with you all that. <laughs> Kundalini is that source. Kundalini is that that inner frequency of relationship between the divine and the physical mundane. For those of you that are hearing this broadcast, that have chosen to listen to it, Feel the energy of the Kundalini coming through this broadcast, through this voice, into your equation, your spiritual equation. Feel it. Let it resonate with you. Taste it like a fine wine. And and see what happens with you in regards to your dreams, your feelings about uh, uh, love and life and balance and why it is you're here, what reason, why are you here, what's going on with you in that area. And then come to this seminar. Come and meet me. Meet Rosemary. There will be more Kundalini awakened people there than you will ever come across of in one room because I get a lot of repeat people coming in. Mm -hmm. And so really begin to open yourself to this idea. Forget about what you read from negative uh, websites uh, throughout the Internet. Anybody can lie on the Internet. I mean, you know, European Union now starting to crack down on people who lie on the Internet, and hopefully the United States will follow course, but I'm not holding my breath. And so you'll get a lot of people lying about Kundalini Syndrome, lying about this, lying about that, trying to stoke people's fears instead of stoke their joy. And I want you to be very aware that, you know, there's a concentrated effort to to distort information about Kundalini. Don't believe it. Mm-hmm. Do not believe it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's the hand of divine in your heart. It's a beautiful, compassionate blessing. Mm-hmm. And you are actually located in Northern California, right? Yeah, I'm in I'm in Santa Rosa, Northern California. You can reach me private email at uh, K Fire for All. So that's K F I R E F O R A L L at Yahoo dot com. Okay. All right. I'll, well, I'll, I'll respond to your emails. All right. Well, thank you so much for taking this time and and just illuminating the audience to to Kundalini and giving them a preview of what they can look forward to in September. Well, thank you, Catherine. Thank you for providing this this platform and for doing the great, beautiful, special service that you give out to the Twin Cities and beyond. Thank every you. Every time you do this show. Thank you so much. All right, enjoy your summer, and we'll see you in the Twin Cities in the fall. In the fall it is. Welcome to the Edge Talk Radio Network, your weekly source for information, empowerment, and connection. The Edge Magazine and its advertisers bring you inspired interviews and conversation on learning and healing, on our sacred journey, and on topics that expand beyond time and space. Now, welcome today's host. Kundalini is an evolutionary energy that is designed for humanity's next step towards a luminous physical and spiritual expression. The Kundalini is in everyone. It is an untapped resource of divinity within us all that is waiting to be awakened and experienced. Never has the time been so right and crucial for a change of this magnitude to be explored and initiated. Greetings. I am Catherine Taylor, and I am the host of Edge Interviews. Tonight, I am thrilled to be bringing to you a conversation with Chris Mitchell, commonly known as Chrism, who will be introducing you to that power within you, the power that is called the Kundalini. Chrism describes himself as, quote, just another person like you, a consciousness clothed in flesh. I do not claim knowledge of the writings or activities of any ancient lineage or sacred text. I do claim the information received 
as is gifted to me by the expanded awareness of the Kundalini. I teach the Kundalini. Activate those who clearly are ready and support those who are awakened and following their Kundalini path. Chrism will be offering his support and activation at the Kundalini Awakening Seminar scheduled to take place in the Twin Cities on September 27th and 28th of this year, 2014, in Egan, Minnesota. For more information, please contact Rosemary at www.rosemaryg at usinternet.com or by calling her at 651-452-3161. You can also visit the website, which is www.kundaliniawakeningssystems1.com. And please just refer to the description of tonight's broadcast and you can get the correct spellings and the way to connect with those. And as we get into the conversation, we will repeat that contact information. So, Chrism, are you there? Hello, Catherine. I'm here. Hi. Well, thank you so much for taking this time to talk to us about this fascinating subject. Well, thank you for having me on, on your program. Uh, hopefully it will it will be a, a service for any and all who hear it. Well, I'm sure it will be. And I think because most people have heard the word kundalini, but, but a lot of people don't understand completely what it is, can we jump into just your giving us a, an overview of what kundalini is? Kundalini is a, a an energetic force and consciousness energy, if you will, that rests dormant at the base of, uh, of a human being's spine. Uh, for most of the population, it rests dormant. For some of the population, it will awaken in their lifetime. And that awakening has very powerful, beautiful, and special uh, skills and experiences that accompany it. Uh, and it also has a, a fair amount of challenges as well if the person... Uh, doesn't have the benefit of a teacher or a system that will help them understand what is occurring. And so this is what I do. This is what I help people with is their kundalini awakening or to to activate their kundalini. And uh, the kundalini itself is this energetic consciousness that rests at the base of the spine uh, coiled around the base of our spine three and a half times. Uh, and it can be awakened through spiritual practices, uh, breathing practices, near-death experiences, accidents, uh, studying with an awakened teacher, uh, just starting meditation. The person can have their kundalini awakened simply because it is time for them. It's, it's like when the, when the, when the fruit is ripe, it is re- ready to be consumed, and that is the same thing with the Kundalini awakening in a person that has really done nothing to invite this. And mm-hmm. You'll forgive me, I have some airport noise behind me here. Is that all right? Oh, that that's fine. Okay? It's, that's, you know, Blog Talk Radio is organic, so there's all those signs. Well, what I find really fascinating, Kristen, is, is that I've always considered Kundalini to be something that would be awakened or provoked by invitation, like someone would go into meditation. You're suggesting and saying that it, it can actually spontaneously emerge. Spon- oh, yeah, absolutely. So, what absolutely would like? so what would that, that look like? Spontaneous. So what would that look like? That would look, well, I mean, it depends on the, on the mental uh, disposition of the individual, mental and emotional disposition. Uh, but typically, uh, it's very beautiful. It's very very exciting it's it's amazing and then depending on the, the the person's outlook in life and their emotional stability whether or not they go into fear in it will begin to really color the experience if they start to go into fear over it well then it can amplify that fear and it can be become very very distorted and twisted and and uh, you know the person can have a fairly difficult time with it uh, but if they choose not to go into fear, they just kind of go with the beauty, go with the grace, go with the love that is happening. Uh, the person will 
go through a series of spontaneous movements that they won't understand. Uh, they'll go through a certain level of bliss, ecstatic bliss. Uh, they'll be happy for like days and days and weeks and weeks and months and months. There'll just be this tremendous level of happiness and joy and serenity that the person has. And then that will taper off. And then a level of detoxification will occur. Emotional detoxification, uh, physical detoxification, uh, you know, karmic detoxification, uh, to, to, to really be clear about it. And as that detoxification occurs, well, they're becoming more and more and more in balance and in harmony with this divine presence within them. And this is a divine presence. Make no mistake. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is the end point of all religions. This is the end point of all spiritual study. This is where physical mundane meets non-physical divine. Mm-hmm. This is that bridge. Well, I I had a friend actually in the early 80s that started meditating, and I'm sure that's what was starting to to be activated in her. But it freaked her out so much, and at that time, she tried to find a place where she could go to get some understanding with it, and it wasn't that readily available. And this was out in California, so is it fairly new to have? people like you who can really guide people through this activation and, and the awakening process? Uh, what's your question again? I'm sorry. Is it fairly new, at least to the Western world, to have people that oh, can yeah. actually be guides through this process? Because I know in the early 80s, even out in California, she wasn't successful and it scared her. So then oh, she no, was one no, that yeah. just pulled back and she quit meditating because she didn't know how to deal with the movements that were coming and accompanying the awakening of the energy in her body. Oh, no, I completely understand. And it's still hard to find a teacher that can actually go into your process. I'm just blessed with being able to do that. Uh, I wish there were more. Mm-hmm. I wish there were more, and there are not. Uh, there, are, there are organizations that, that kind of pretend to... You know, if you become a Hindu or you become this or you become that, then they can explain it to you using their own words. But to believe it, you have to kind of follow that religion. And Kundalini, as I mentioned, is beyond religion. Mm-hmm. It is the end point. Of, and so what is required is a, is a level of teachers, which I'm trying to produce, actually, through these seminars. I'm trying to produce Kundalini teachers. Mm-hmm. Uh, to go out into the populations and to begin to explain to them that no, 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 this does not have to be so scary for you. This is this is what's going on here and this is what's going on there. And put your tongue up behind your upper front teeth here and put your fingers in this position there and drink lots of water and stop drinking caffeine and you know all of these types of things. And you can learn to do this. I had never seen myself as a writer before, but the Kundalini had other ideas, and so uh, a bunch of writings came through, and a bunch of writings were put up, and uh, people started reading those writings, and uh, started responding to those writings in very positive ways, which, which you know, really bolstered the whole idea of giving these teachings through the written format, and then from there, you know, 300 uh, YouTube videos were created. Mm. And, uh, you know, these 300 YouTube videos can be reached by people just going uh, to to Chris and Kundalini on YouTube, and, and it'll come up. Mm-hmm. Well, I imagine if somebody just even went in and searched Kundalini, that they would ultimately get to your channel. Uh, say again? Say, well, I w- well, YouTube is now the, the fastest growing search engine. It's uh, What I've heard is it's surpassed Google. And so what I'm saying is that people could just go in and in the YouTube channel itself search for Kundalini, and I'm sure they'd be taken to some of your videos and, and YouTube well, videos. To some of them, yeah. There's, you know, everybody and their uncle now, uh, you know, seems to feel that they're a Kundalini awakened teacher or master. And so whether they've had it or not, mm-hmm. you know, and so you get a famous author out there, well, I wrote a really good book, and so I must have Kundalini, right? Uh, which is absolutely not true. So for someone uh, who's really searching, they really need to do their homework 
to find someone yeah. who can guide him who's who's had the experience yeah. and yeah. who has mm-hmm. the knowledge of of that instruction exactly exactly you want to find a teacher who first of all is willing to take the time with you as an individual mm-hmm. i find a lot of these big names these big authors these these so-called teachers you know they'll answer a general question but they don't care about you as an individual mm-hmm. you know you need to be able to have a teacher that will go in see your process understand your tro- your process and and begin to teach you about your process mm-hmm. not about his process but about your process and your karma and and the the uh, the challenges that the Kundalini is bringing up for you in your process to work through, the uh, gifts that that same Kundalini is also bringing up, and to be able to explain those gifts so that they don't frighten a person. Mm-hmm. Things like that. so, is it like the relationship a student would have with a guru, or how would you define that relationship between uh, you, you know, and someone guru, helping? Guru has a very Guru has a very negative connotation in the West. Uh, master has a very negative connotation in the West. Uh, so for me, it's just teacher. Teacher's fine. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And what's the structure? Like if someone wanted to work with you, how would, how do they go about it? How how do you... Well, they, are, they, are, they, they need to read the writings. They need to begin practicing the safety protocols for Kundalini awakening. Then... Uh, we will either meet over Skype, you know, if they're living a long ways away, or we'll meet in person, and we'll begin we'll begin to to work with them on an individual basis about where they need to go, how they need to get there, what they need to do, and uh, you know what what process is going to happen for for them. Mm-hmm. And that that is a huge blessing because when you have no instruction and this type of of stuff happens to you. It, to to say that it makes you think you're crazy is putting it very very lightly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, you and I think you're accurate. Your reality, right? But. And I think you're accurate that many people get into the mental health arena, and then the diagnoses come, and the labels come, and there's a lot of people in the back wards who are being given all these you know medications that quiet them that really just need to be guided and helped through this journey, I would assume. Oh, that's right. That's right. Because, you know, you can hear voices with a Kundalini awakening. And hearing voices is, you know, one of the prime uh, uh, diagnoses for schizophrenia. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Okay. You can hear a voice. You can hear an entity. You can hear all of that. And and if you tell an MD or a, a psychologist, a psychiatrist that you're hearing voices, well, there they go. They're getting out the uh, the schizophrenic drugs. Right, absolutely. And they're not even. They're not. You know what's All they have to do is hear that few that one sentence from you. All I hear voices are literally guide a person away from committing suicide because they have a spontaneous Kundalini awakening. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, I think the reframe and just the understanding would have been so helpful to her because then it could have been directed. So I think I think we're really blessed to have people like you who have gone through it yourself. In fact, can you share a little bit about what your journey was? Because I'm sure when you came into this, there weren't a lot of teachers that were available to you. There were, yeah, there were no teachers. There were no books. Um, when this started to occur to me, well, first of all, I was born with a level of awakening already intact and. And I need to preface that statement by saying that when you have the Kundalini awakened within you, it comes with you after you die. It is there with you along with your memories and your karma and the the touch of the divine never ever leaves the soul that it has touched. The touch of the divine has no... Uh, it doesn't wear off with time. It doesn't lose its power. It is always the same. It is always strong. And so what happened to me is I, I was born into this world and I had all the symptoms of Kundalini awakening as a child without knowing that that's what the symptoms were. Mm-hmm. And so as a child, you can become easily open to this type of thing because your your, your ego hasn't matured to the point where 
you know, you know, everything is set in stone according to how the ego wants it to be, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. As a child, you're able to kind of, uh, you know, figure this out or see if this feels good or that feels good. And I worked with that, and I had a lot of experiences that were positive, but I had a lot more that weren't so positive. It was very difficult uh, uh, to be transported to the Amazon jungle every night mm-hmm. for years. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Uh, I didn't know what a howler monkey was. It's, I just knew that they scared the heck out of me. Mm-hmm. I didn't know what, what these different animals I would come into contact were. Every night this occurred to me. Every night until about the age of 13. And then it stopped. And then I was able to, to have somewhat of a normal um, um, high school experience, junior high high school experience until it it came back again at the age of 24, uh, but but as you know, as I you know, after our, this body, so so let me let me go back again. So if you have the Kundalini, and it's come to you uh, into your next expression, your next lifetime, and you're a child. Uh, you go through a level of karmic burning, karmic balancing through the Kundalini, but your the Kundalini that was there in the previous life is guiding you now. It's guiding you now as a child. And you're guided to read certain things. You're guided to experience certain things. You're guided to do certain things. And I was guided to do the, you know, certain types of things, whether it was meditation. Uh, I would go out and, and meditate in the in the wilderness when I was nine, you know, and I would say things like, you know, Spirits of the universe send me a gift or something of that nature. And I would always get that gift. And I had learned not to talk about it with my parents because my parents didn't understand any of this. They, you know, they were chalking it up to an overactive imagination. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so I learned not to talk about it with people. I learned to have these blessed little skills uh, that I had without bringing attention to myself. And that was a very big lesson to not want to be Superman, even though you may have Superman attributes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and so so as this matured within me and my, my uh, emotional maturity uh, accompanied that, uh, you know, I, I, I was kind of designed uh, within a healing mentality, you know, since that time. And, you know, for that healing ment- mentality... You know, I had to know what it is to be sick as well as what it is to be well. You need to know both sides mm-hmm. of the coin. Contest. And so I was shown that through various experiences. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, at the age of 13, it, it kind of went on hold for about 10 years. When I was 24, uh, 23, 24, it came back. And it came back because of a visitation from a discarnate entity that, decided to sit down on the edge of my bed and lean over and envelop me in their energy. And uh, after that, wow, the kundalini jumped up and, and it was active in me for uh, from then to now. Mm-hmm. Um, so this body, this physical body that's forming these words that you're hearing right now, this body had to go through its own awakening, just like the... Uh, in the previous life, that body had to go through it. Well, now this body had to go through that that rewiring event. And so at the age of 30, I had the uh, primary spinal sweep, which is the kundalini, you know, uh, awakening from the base of the spine, traveling up the spine and out, going out the fontanelle of the person and showering down in, in, in light, uh, around the person, and of course, putting the uh, the physical body into various uh, automatic positions of grace and reception and bliss and ecstasy, and you know all these really, really beautiful, beautiful experiences. And after that, you know, I had to kind of relearn what Kundalini was. Mm-hmm. And as I mentioned before, there were no teachers. Uh, so I had to just kind of figure this out on my own, and I and I did, you know, I was in the corporate world, you know, I was on my way to becoming, you know, a manager at uh, MCA at the time, which was a big company at the time, MCA, Music Company of America, and I was uh, 
working the, the corporate ladder there. And after the Kundalini came, everything stopped in the mundane world for me. I had to, I had to learn why, you know, I was experiencing what I was experiencing. I had, I knew I had to figure it out. I knew that this wasn't going to go well if, if I stayed in the corporate world. This was going to be a very difficult scenario. It was already getting difficult. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I became homeless for the next 10 years or more, hmm. trying to figure this out. Well, I had medical experience, so I knew that it wasn't a medical problem, I, but I also knew that my my SOAP diagnosis, my subjective objective assessment prognosis wasn't going, wasn't looking very good. And, uh, you know, from my own, uh, you know, deductive reasoning, I knew that I I couldn't take it to a counselor, a psychologist, psychiatrist, MD, anybody, because they were just going to push Prozac-oriented uh, chemicals and medications at me and, and label me with uh, schizophrenia, with positive uh, expressions of bipolarism, things of that nature, which are absolutely untrue, mm-hmm. but which Kundalini can bring about. And so I can't fault the, med- the medical people for making that DX because or that diagnosis, because uh, people will exhibit some of the very similar phenomena that, uh, that those that have those, those illnesses will exhibit. And so, you know, it's an easy mistake mm-hmm. to make. Mm-hmm. So then how, so I did, didn't do that. how did you find your path into being a teacher, from being homeless to find, being a teacher? See, no, I, I, I didn't find that path. That path found me. All right. I, uh, distinction. Yeah. I wasn't looking to be a teacher. I didn't really, you know, I, I was not looking to be a teacher. But I could see because the Kundalini will push you into selfless service for other people. I could see that I was being pushed into that area by the Kundalini itself. And by that time, I had learned through trial and error that you don't resist the Kundalini when it. When it wants to push you in a certain way, well, you answer that push with, yes, okay, absolutely, here we go. And that's what I did. That's what I did. I, uh, I just, I started a Yahoo group and, and it just grew exponentially really fast. And, uh, the Kundalini started doing its teachings through that group. And, and now we have like close to, I think, uh, seven or eight communities and, uh, you know, we have people from all over the world, thousands of people. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of the genesis of the teaching. And here's the thing is, you know, I put out the website Kundalini Awakening Systems One dot com and the writings that came through the Kundalini pretty much speak for themselves. Person reads those writings, they'll feel the Kundalini. I, I can't say that the writing's the greatest, but that was those were the earlier days you know back in 2005 2006 when i was just starting